Okay, so can everyone see my screen all right? Okay, yeah, I think I'm screen sharing. So I'm gonna start off with explaining data set distributions. And most of you probably already know what a train and a test set is, um, but I'm just gonna explain it a bit um, more clear and give an understanding of what like a validation set means and just make uh, some of the stuff more clear in case some of you guys are a bit confused. So um, the main like two distributions we use are a train and a test. And so essentially the way it works is we train our model on this training data. So we perform um, like that model, we use our training data, which is usually around 80%. Um, and we train our model on that. And then finally, when our model is ready for, like when we want to check the accuracy and just uh, see how our model is performing, that's when we um, use the test data to see and like evaluate all the different metrics like accuracy and AUC and like all the different metrics you guys have been using um, in the sessions before. So like a typical split um, you guys have probably been using is something like 80% train and 20% test. Um, but like in the context of deep learning, um, like data has been increasingly um, becoming just larger and larger. So data sets are becoming much bigger. And actually the split is becoming more skewed. So it's skewing more towards the train. So um, sometimes you're gonna find deep learning models that use like 99% train or 95% train and 5% test. Um, and the reason for that is because we have such a large amount of data. Um, so this is like for data sets, uh, like very popular data sets. Um, for example, like there's a cats versus dogs data set that is huge. Um, there's some data sets with like a million images. And in that case, we wanna make sure that we're trying to uh, reserve as much data as we can for the training aspect. And we want to put little into the test because we want to focus our model and try to make it as good as we can. And so the goal of deep learning is to have like a huge amount of data and be able to um, like train on just a large amount of data, which is why this split is no longer becoming um, like super uh, common in deep learning is becoming more skewed. So more like 90% train, 10% test or um, and, and like if you have a bigger data set, you guys are sometimes going to use like 90, 95% train and 5% test. Um, and so like in some of the projects we do, we're going to be changing up the split a bit because this is probably like the common split you guys use for train and test. Um, and just, just one thing to add, if you guys have any questions or are confused about anything, just um, message me in the chat um, so that like I can answer any of your questions. Um, so then there's also a thing called a validation set. Um, and a validation set is essentially a way for us to test different um, hyperparameters in our model. So what I mean by that is in a neural network, you have like the number of layers and the number of uh, neurons in each of the layers. And so those two things are called hyperparameters and there's more like the alpha, the alpha learning rate or like uh, learning rate decay, et cetera. There's many hyperparameters in a neural network. And the validation set is essentially um, the set where we decide what is the best choice for these hyperparameters. And you're also going to see that like usually the split would be 60% train, 20% validation, and 20% test. Uh, this is probably the most common split. Um, but again, in the context of deep learning, since we just have so much data, um, there's going to be a, a huge skew towards this training set. So there's going to be probably like, like if you have around a million images in a data set, you're going to have like 1% validation 1% test and like 98% training. So this happens when you have like a million images, but if you have a small data set and you're using a neural network, I suggest a split that looks something like this. Um, and again, the reason for this is because we want to put as much of our data and effort into this training because we want to make our model as good as we can. So that's the idea behind a validation um, set. And so now I'm just kind of go over Kind of how to make your neural network better and some problems you can encounter when building a certain neural network and sort of how to fix those problems and improve from there. So I'm going to start off by explaining what bias and variance is and some of you, I mean, I think most of you have already uh, learned some of this in, I believe, the second session or one of the sessions, I think Rebecca taught you guys like overfitting and underfitting. And so bias and variance are basically just words to describe each of these. So a high bias means you're underfitting a lot and a high variance means you're overfitting a lot. And you can kind of um, like understand it from the meaning of this. So bias just means like uh, you're biased towards data, which means you don't have like a very um, sort of strict boundary that separates two data lines. And variance just means it's like, like completely just going off charts and 
taking every single little piece of data into account. And so we want something that's in the middle. And so you can see that high bias is not able to exactly separate the X's from the O's and the high variance is able to get every single O and separate it from every single X. But when we get more data, this is not going to be the best graph we want to use. Sorry. This is not going to be the best graph we want to use to differentiate between um, two different classes. And so that's where we want to do something in between. So I'm going to go over um, different ways we can prevent high bias or different ways we can um, kind of fix the underfitting issue in our model. But we're actually going to focus more on this overfitting side because this is more common. Um, this is actually less common, especially with neural networks, because there's a lot of computations and a lot of layers and neurons you guys normally use in neural networks, um, which is why this is usually a bigger problem. And when I say fix, I just mean we want to improve uh, like one, so we want to improve this variance thing. So we want to make it less of an overfitting problem. But at the same time, we do not want to compromise any underfitting, which means we don't want to um, kind of make this like that. So we don't want to transform this graph into that, which means we don't want to compromise this overfitting for an underfitting approach. So we want to have something that's in the middle. Um, so this is like a short, like practical guide I made in case you're just confused about what to do. So let's say you just had a neural network and you see that it has a high bias. And a high bias just means it's underfitting. And you could see that from the previous slide. And if you have a high bias, there's typically two main solutions people use, which is either just creating a bigger network. So that just means more layers, more neurons, just making it more complex so it can make more complex calculations. Um, so that's one way. And this is probably the most common way. The second way is just training it for longer and longer periods of time so that it can make um, more and more complex correlations between data. So that's, sorry, I keep moving. Um, that's high bias, and then we have high variance. So there's many different ways to prevent variance, but I guess the two main ways um, would be first to just collect more data. We just wanna get as much training data as we can. Um, and the reason for that is because if we just have a ton of more data, then our model is less likely to um, overfit because we're going to have lots of data and we're going to be able to make a um, sort of curve or a differentiation between two classes based on that. Um, which is why collecting more data is important and that's why deep learning is actually very successful because of the amount of data deep learning models typically use. Um, the other way, um, this is pretty common, is reg uh, regularization or dropout and I'll explain these two things in detail. Um, but this is just a way for us to um, just make sure that we're not completely overfitting in our model. So I'm going to start off with explaining what regularization is. And so there's two types, there's L1 and L2, but L2 is just like the most common type and what most people use. Um, L1 is essentially when you use like a linear factor, but L2 is when you're using um, like a more quadratic factor. Uh, so let me just explain what I mean by adding a factor. So the way regularization works is you basically just add an extra term to the cost function. So you guys have learned about cost functions and that's basically just um, like in a model, you always have a cost function and the goal of the model is to minimize that cost function. So if we add a factor that's just bigger, so like this is the normal cost function, let's say this was uh, uh, like a mean squared error or whatever. And then we want to add a term right after that. And this is called the regularization term. And the purpose of adding this term is so that when we make the cost bigger, that means that we're not going to be trying to overfit for such small data points like that. We're going to be able to make a more generalized curve and smooth curve. Um, and so basically the way, again, just to explain this in simple words, the, way, the idea behind a cost function, I mean, the idea behind your model is to minimize the cost function. And if we just add this huge term to the cost function, it's not gonna be like super uh, susceptible to minor changes, which means like we're gonna be able to have this uh, regularizing uh, term, which is why it's called L2 regularization. So it's just a way for us to make it such, such that our model does not um, be like such uh, susceptible to like these kind of small changes. So you can see here, this is a regularization um, in place. So you can see that we have just a smooth curve following the points, but this would be an example of like an overfitted curve that's just trying to get every single data point. So it's successfully able to do that, but you can tell that the blue curve is just not a very good way for representing data that comes in the future. Um, so that's what L2 regularization 
worksite, you just add an extra term and we'll go over that a bit later, um, especially in some of the projects we're gonna be doing next class. Um, but that's the idea behind this. Now there's another way, and this is one of the most common ways um, that is specific to neural networks and it's called dropout. And so in neural network, you always have the input layer, uh, which just gets all the features. Then you have these like multiple hidden layers and then finally an output layer. And the idea behind dropout is just to cancel some of these different nodes or neurons. And what I mean by that is we're just gonna remove the connection. So I think this diagram over here uh, makes it a bit more clear. So you can see this neuron doesn't have any connections to it. And that's because we removed all of it. So we also did the same for this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So, so the reason why this makes it um, better is because usually when, we, when we're overfitting, part of the reason could be we have like a super complex network with so many connections. So it's, it's able to perfectly fit the training data, but it's having um, a big accuracy hit on the uh, test data. And that's usually because we have these crazy different connections and it's just way too advanced. And so the goal of dropout is just to make our neural network more simple. Um, and so we just cancel random nodes like that. And some of you are probably wondering, how do we determine what nodes to cancel? Um, and so that's actually like a completely random process, but there is something we can control. And so let's say we had four nodes like that, and we want to cancel half of the nodes. We can set a dropout factor to 0 0.5. So the factor can be from 0 to 1. And in this case, we're setting it to 0 0.5, uh, um, which just means that we're going to be canceling half of these. If I set it to like 0 0.75, you would be canceling three-fourths of these. And so again, dropout can actually have a great effect on your, ne uh, on your neural network and it can increase your accuracy by 10 to 15 or sometimes even more. Um, and that's an accuracy. So that's the idea behind dropout. You just cancel some of these random nodes. Okay. Um, now let's go to a third way. And so I mentioned in the practical guide that another way for preventing overfitting is just by um, increasing the amount of data. Um, but the problem lies when you actually do not, if you do not have access to more data. So let's say you only had like um, 100 images and you wanted to get more data of these like cats and dogs, but you just couldn't find them. So you didn't have those uh, like different types of data. Um, so there is a way to resolve that and that's called data augmentation. And so we're going to be also putting that into practice in some of the projects um, in some of the projects next class. And so data augmentation is a pretty popular concept. And the idea behind it is just we take one training example. So we take this one cat, let's say this was one out of 100 uh, images in our data set, and we just take one of them and we just kind of contort it differently. So we kind of like rotate it, uh, we crop it, like in this case, also crop it here. Um, and this is uh, different ways you can augment it. You can also like shift it to the side so you can make this cat appear over here. Sorry, like my drawing is just terrible. Um, but you can just kind of shift the cat in different places in the image. You can um, put a mirror so you can see these two are mirrored images. You can just stretch the cat so you can make it like super stretched. You can just crop certain areas. Um, so there's like different tools you can use for basically augmenting this one training example into six other different uh, types. And so there is a slight problem when using this technique, and that's that we do not want to create very similar um, types of examples. You can see that like this one and this one is pretty similar. So we want to avoid trying to create like very similar types of data because that's just going to make our model um, overfit even more because we just keep having the same training examples and it's not like an accurate representation of how we would use this model in real life. So that's why you want to make sure that you're using the correct data augmentation techniques and that you're um, like making these look very different from each other, um, but they're still all derived from just one example. So like one could be completely stretched, one can be just cropped, so you only get a small portion, and then there could be a mirrored version, one can be shifted. So these are just different ways to augment your data, um, but this is actually like a really helpful concept and uh, machine learning practitioners or especially deep learning practitioners use this all the time. And it can be used in any model you really use. It's not really specific to neural networks. And that's the same with uh, regularization. Uh, regularization can be used with any model, like an SVM, random forest, regression, any of those, because you just need to add that extra term to the cost function. 
Um, so that's why like regularization can be used with any model, but dropout is specific to neural networks because you're just canceling those nodes and you don't find nodes in like regression. Um, and then data augmentation is something that you can use in almost any model. Um, so now let's discuss early stopping. Um, so the idea behind early stopping is just, uh, this is not necessarily like a, a way to prevent overfitting, but it can help prevent overfitting. Um, this is just like a general uh, good way for making your model perform the best that it can. So this graph is um, it's error or like cost function by the number of epochs, uh, just to make that clear. So basically like as the epochs go on, we wanna see how is the error doing? Is it continuously decreasing? And that's what we want, or is it like increasing a bit? And so what we wanna do is basically just monitor this graph as the model is training. So like if we had a really big model, it would be pretty slow. So we can just watch it as it goes. And if we uh, see that like it starts to peak up, we can just stop the training right there and stop it from con uh, continue to keep training on. Um, because you can see like the cost starts to increase here and we don't want that. We only want the cost to decrease, uh, which is why we could just stop it right over here um, because you can see that like both of these graphs look like they're continuously moving downwards, which is what we want. Um, we don't want something that looks like that. Like that's just not what we want. We don't want the cost to decrease and then increase. So that's why we can just stop the training right there and only get this part of the graph. Um, so that's like the idea behind early stopping. You're just uh, stopping the model once it reaches the lowest possible error. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're cognizant of both these curves. Um, training is important, but I would say validation is even more because you're trying to look at um, overfitting and underfitting problems. Like if you see the validation is just doing terribly. Um, so if you see that, uh, give me a second. Okay, I can't really use the annotation tool. Um, but basically, let's say you had this training continuously moving down, but then your validation was just like staying up here. Then you know that you have a huge overfitting issue because your training, um, it seems like your error just keeps going down or your cost function, you're able to minimize it as well as you can. Um, but for validation, it looks like your error is just staying um, like stagnant. It's not changing at all. And that's when you know, so like these graphs are very helpful. So error versus number of epochs, this is a very popular graph for using. And it also helps you determine like, are you overfitting? Are you underfitting? And that's where early stopping can sometimes help. If like your validation curve seems to be doing worse than your training curve, then you know it's an overfitting problem. And that's when you can basically just stop it pretty early on in the training process. Um, so that's how early stopping works. Um, now let's look at normalizing input. So I believe like in some of the notebooks you guys have done so far, like in the random forest and in the logistic regression ones, um, you guys have normalized your inputs. And what that means is, uh, let's say you had, okay. Um, okay, it looks like Kavya has a question and that is, what are epochs? So let me go back. So an epoch is just, um, every time, so every time you uh, finish training, finish going over your whole data set, that is one epoch. So like once your um, model has gone over the whole data set and gone over all the images um, and it's performed one like gradient descent step downwards, then that's one epoch. And so um, I think the best way for explaining an epoch is just, uh, it's the number of times that the uh, model passes over your whole training uh, data set. So does that make more sense, Kavya, or do you want me to explain that in more detail? Okay, yeah. Um, and actually, we're going to um, go over epochs and different types of grading descent, like in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, so like, I'll explain this in more detail for those who are still confused about epochs. Um, so now normalizing inputs. So let's say you had like one feature and let's say this is just like a, a numerical kind of data set, not image based. Let's say you had uh, one feature that had a range from zero to 255 and then another that was like negative three to like one. Um, then you see that these two are just like completely different ranges and it can even be more drastic than this. This can be like a thousand to like 3000 and this can be like all the way in the negatives. Um, so again, like, sorry for my bad penmanship, but hopefully that makes sense. Let's say you just had like two completely distinct ranges. So one's on a complete different range and the other is just like on a complete negative range. 
Um, and so what we want to do in that case is essentially normalize the inputs. So we want to make them all on the same scale. And so this is an example of, um, so gradient descent, just for those who forgot, is just a way for us to optimize our weights and our models. So like, let's say we had, let's say this was our cost function. What gradient descent does is let's say our, our error was all the way at the top at the start. Gradient descent just helps us take a step in the right direction, which is at the very bottom of the curve. So it just helps us keep going down like that. And this is kind of a, a, an illustration of gradient descent, except it's in a contour plot. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about contour plots, but it's just a way um, to sort of visualize things like this. So this is an example if we did not normalize our inputs. So it's just kind of uh, zigzagging all over the place before it reaches the final input. Um, and you can see like the, the contour plot is also not flat like this. Um, this is an example when we fully normalize our inputs and we put them on the uh, same scale. And so there's different ways for normalizing inputs, um, but like I think the main way we're going to be using is just like dividing. So if I had something like a thousand to two thousand, um, and then like negative five to one, I would just divide both of these by like two fifty five, so that they get on a smaller and more similar scale. Um, but there's another more accurate way for normalizing inputs, and that's by using standard deviation and um, mean, but I'm not going to be going over that right now. You can look more into that. Um, I believe it's called like Xavier initialization. Um, I forgot what it's called, but it's basically just another way for us to normalize inputs. Um, and just how we normalize inputs, I didn't include this on this slide, um, but like just how we normalize our inputs. If you remember the way a neural network works is we have these like weights and biases. So like, let's say we just had three different features and then we had a bunch of hidden neurons like that, and you just had connections to each of these. Sorry again for my bad drawing. Um, and just like continue to have this and all the connections are made. Um, each of these different neurons has to have an initial weight. And if you remember, a weight is basically just um, what connects these two. Sorry, this does not have a weight, it's just the actual, actual connection has a weight. This has a value of the feature but we want to be able to, sorry, value of the neuron. We want to be able to initialize these weights. Um, and so like this normalized inputs, the same concept is used for weights. We want to make sure that they're normalized and they're not like completely on different scales because that can just um, skew our network. And just to, again, just to reiterate, um, what you do is you, you're, the goal of the neural network is just to make the best possible value of the weights. And the way you change the weights is by using gradient descent. So you use gradient descent to constantly update these weights and make it the best possible combination for us to retrieve like a final output like that. So like, let's say we just had one output neuron. We wanna make it such that all these weights are the exact like right value such that this always outputs the right answer. So that's what gradient descent does. It just uses back propagation and it just goes backward to update each of these weights. And, but we want to be able to initialize these weights at the very start. So before we start our model, we want to be able to initialize these weights. And some of you are probably wondering, like, why not we just put all of these to zero? Um, and that's actually just a terrible idea. You do not want to set it to zero. It's just going to mess up your whole model. Because if you think about it, if this is set to zero and this is set to zero, all these are going to start off at zero. And so like when you continue to train your model, a lot of them are going to remain at zero and it's just not going to be an accurate representation of what you want your model to predict. Um, and so that's why we just do random initialization here. And, um, and we also have to normalize the weights in that case. So that's just a quick uh, random thing. I just wanted to explain that normalizing inputs um, is a concept that you actually also use in terms of weights. And that's called batch normalization for those who um, are more interested in that, you can feel free to search it up and kind of understand how, how batch normalization works. Okay, so those are just like five different ways to um, kind of prevent overfitting. So I'm just going to quickly, in case you guys forgot, you can take note of this. So first is regularization. Second is dropout. Third is just augmenting your data or adding more data. Fourth is stopping your model early on so that it doesn't like continue to increase in this error versus epochs curve. Um, and then fifth is just normalizing your inputs and making sure that they're all on the same scale so that you can have like a smooth um, kind of uh, line like that. And I'll explain kind of what this graph means in more detail a bit later in these slides. 
Um, so now let's just discuss uh, ways to prevent underfitting. Um, and so the main way is just to increase uh, the number of neurons and like number of layers in your network. And this is kind of overkill. Um, so probably not like not this much, um, but there's definitely uh, networks with like over a hundred layers and like super advanced tons of computations used in them. And that's in like the more advanced networks. Um, but this is just an example of a more complex network. So let's say you had this network um, initially and it was just performing really badly. Like it was not able to, um, it was like doing really bad on the training set, which means it was not even able to do well on the training set itself. Um, so the way that you would um, like help that would just by would just be by increasing the number of uh, neurons in each of these layers as well as increasing the number of layers. Um, and so each of these things are called hyperparameters. So like changing the number of layers in your network, that's something that you as a programmer can control. And so I'm going to discuss basically like how we can um, optimize that and make sure we have the exact number of networks and TensorFlow the tool you guys used in like the last two classes is actually like it has a great tool for um, kind of tuning your hyperparameters. So I'll explain again hyperparameters in more detail if you're a bit confused by what that means. Um, but essentially the main way that you would prevent underfitting is just by doing this. And if this doesn't work, you would just train your model for longer, um, though that's probably not like the best option because it can compromise um, the overfitting issue, which is why you usually want to do this. Okay, um, if you have any questions, just make sure you ask me in the chat. I know that was like probably a lot of new information for some of you. Okay, so I guess I'll move on. So, so uh, most of you guys probably already learned about gradient descent in the previous sessions. And so I'm gonna explain there's three different types of gradient descent and what is like the use, the use cases for each of them. Like when should you use each of them? Um, so the first is called batch gradient descent. And this is what you guys have been using, um, I believe. Um, and batch gradient descent is basically just uh, when you go over the whole training set and only make a step in the right direction once you do that. Um, so that was probably a bit abstract, but what I mean by that is we have the same curve as before. So if you remember, we had epochs. Iterations and epochs are just synonyms, um, but epochs is like a more formal term, I guess, in the machine learning community. Um, but this is the same kind of graph. So what batch gradient descent does is let's say we start off at here. So our model initially start off at here. Um, what we want to do is just, let's say we had a training data set of like, I don't know, let's say this just resembled like 200 images. Um, what gradient descent is gonna do is it goes over each of these training samples, um, specifically batch gradient descent. It goes over each of these training examples and it, tries to minimize the cost function for the whole training set in general. So it basically just adds up all these individual cost functions from each of these training sets, uh, sorry, each of these data points in the training set, and it determines like an overall cost function of the training set, and then it tries to minimize that. So only once it's gone over the whole training set, then gradient descent will probably move in the right direction downwards. Um, and you can, some of you can probably already see like the disadvantage of this. Like if you have a huge data set, it's going to be hard for us to go over each one of these training examples and compile all of them into one value. And only after that can we move in the right step. And we would have to do this right step thing, like move in the right direction, like a lot of times. And that's why we, we want to make sure that um, we don't always use batch gradient descent. But this is what batch gradient descent does. And it's probably the most accurate and cleanest way. So if you're able to do batch gradient descent, um, and like if you're if it's not exceeding the amount of time you want it to run within um, Then I suggest you use batch gradient descent because it's the most accurate and it has the cleanest curve like that So just pretty simple it just continuously decreases and gradient descent just moves in the right direction each of these times um, But the problem is when we have like a huge uh, training set it becomes very costly uh, So that's when I'm going to introduce you to two other types of gradient descent approaches so let me just clear up the screen. Okay, so the second one is mini batch gradient descent. And so what mini batch does is, let's say I had a training set like this, and I had like, each of these are different data points. Um, just to recap what batch gradient descent does is it um, goes through each of these, adds up the cost function, and attempts to minimize that. 
a mini batch essentially just only goes in these small mini batches step. And once it's finished doing a mini batch, then it'll move in the right direction. So once it's here, it's gonna move in the right direction. Once it evaluates this one, it'll move in here. So you can see that um, this approach, um, it's kind of in between. So it, it's able to move faster because it doesn't have to go through the whole training set. It just goes in small batches and then tries to move. Um, you can see that this is probably like less costly and a bit faster. Um, the only problem is you can see it's kind of jagged. So it still converges to the right place, which is all the way down here. Um, but you can see in the process, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And so this is not a huge problem as long as it's not going like that. Like that's just not what we want. We want it to be small fluctuations. Um, and so this is probably, if you have a big training set, I would say this is the best approach. Um, so like, let's say you, you had a hundred samples, I would suggest a batch gradient descent, the one before, but if you had on the order of like a thousand, then I would suggest mini batch. Um, so a thousand to probably 10,000, that's probably the area that you would use mini batch. And these are just my recommendations from experience. Um, but like, yeah, this is just probably gives you a general idea of like what size data set do you need to execute these different types of grain descent. So this would be um, the range when you would use this type of grain descent. So you can see that it's in between. Um, it does kind of fluctuate a bit, but at the same time, it's decently fast. Um, now let's go to the last type. And this is basically the other extreme. It's called stochastic gradient descent. And that's when we just have a, a ton of different fluctuations in our data. Um, so it looks like Shritan has a question. So each epoch is only going through the mini batches or is the epoch going through all of the mini batches? So each epoch would, would be defined as going through each of the mini batches. Um, so what I mean by that is if you had like a data set like this and different test points like that, this um, would be called one pass through a batch, which would also be equivalent to um, an epoch. And so you can see that it, every epoch, it's able to move in a generally right direction. So each of these would be called epochs. And this is another hyperparameter, ch uh, changing how many mini batches you want in your data set. So let's say I had something like, um, I don't know, like 1500 data points. I can, I can choose to have like, um, each mini batch should be like 30 data points and I have uh, 50 of those. Um, so 50 different mini batches with 30 data points in each of them. So this could be like a potential um, way for me to do this. And there's different variations, obviously. You just need to find um, like two numbers that multiply by each other to get this. So just two different factors of the data set um, to be able to perform this. And this is another example of hyperparameters. So I hope that answers your question, um, Shritan. Okay, um, so now uh, we're going to uh, go over what stochastic gradient descent does. Um, sorry, I can't get this stupid annotation tool. Okay, um, yeah, so stochastic gradient descent um, is actually this one over here. And you can see that it's just like all over the place. And what stochastic gradient descent does is let's say I had a huge training set like this and different data points in there. Um, instead of going through batches, it only goes through one. So um, let me just clear that. It only goes one at a time. So after every one of these, then it makes a step. So you can see there's like a ton of fluctuations because um, it's not able to accurately represent like the general um, understanding of the whole data set because it only takes one example at a time, which is why it has so many of these fluctuations. But at the same time, this is probably the fastest. Like it moves really fast. Um, even though it will take like a lot of fluctuations to get to this point. So it is like a fast pass through the data set. Let's say we had, um, so I would suggest using this if you had on the order of 100,000 to like 1 million or like greater than that. So this would probably be like the right time to use this. But in general, I would say most of your data sets are gonna be like around 10K 
images. Um, like if we're going to be actually creating a legit model. So like in this course, we're just going to be using some sample data sets. But if you were to like after this course, build your own machine learning model, you would usually use a data set that has like a large amount of data. So probably like 10K. And that's when you would uh, usually use mini batch. And you can again, just play around with these three different types and choose which one works best for you. Um, but it looks like stochastic works the fastest and it's still able to get uh, to the point. So that's usually when um, this is like the right data size you would use to perform this. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about the three? You can kind of see all of them illustrated here. So um, batch is like, it clearly goes to the main point we want to get to. Uh, mini batch is like a blip fluctuating, but it's able to go in the right direction. And stochastic's just like confused and all over the place, but it still is eventually able to get to the right point. Um, okay, so if no one asks any questions, I'm assuming everyone understands it so far. So that was three different types of green descent. And um, so it's like up, really up to you when you want to use those different types. Um, and we'll discuss that in more detail in the notebook that I use today. So now we're going to uh, discuss optimizers. So there's different variations of green descent. So I just explained like uh, those three types of green descent. Um, but there's different ways we can modify gradient descent into a different optimizer. So gradient descent is called an optimizer. And what an optimizer does is just, uh, it helps, it makes the model more accurate, right? Because it helps it step in the right direction of where we want it to go. Um, but there is not only gradient descent, there's uh, two main other, there's actually three main other optimizers. So momentum, uh, RMS prop, and atom. And from these three, I'm going to explain all of them. But the most popular and most common is usually Atom and sometimes RMS prop. So all three of these different things I just mentioned, momentum, RMS prop, and Atom, they are all based off gradient descent. They're just, um, they just have like a bit more math in it that makes it more accurate, I would say. And so all this time, you've probably been using gradient descent, um, maybe sometimes Atom but I'm just gonna explain the difference between all these and then explain why like Adam would be the best. And so there's like some decently advanced math. It's, it's pro I think it's just like algebra and a bit of calculus. Um, there's just um, math involved in each of these that makes it better. Um, so I'm not gonna go in depth in the math, um, but I'll give like a brief explanation of what each of these different variations do. The first is called momentum. So people also refer to it as gradient descent with momentum. Um, and so like the reason for using these different optimizers is let's say we have, let's say we were using something like stochastic gradient descent and we had like all these random fluctuations before we got to the main point. We want to be able to reduce all these different like random just movements all over the place. And that's when like momentum can come in handy. And so momentum essentially uses this thing called exponentially weighted averages. And it's actually not a very hard concept. Um, if you search it up, you'll probably be able to understand it pretty easily if you like watch a few videos and stuff. Um, but I'm not going to go in depth in this. It's just a way for us to reduce fluctuation in one dimension. So it lets us uh, remove fluctuation, let's say in this dimension. So like instead of, okay, I'm going to actually remove that. So instead of having something like this, you would change it to like this. And then that's the final point. And what I mean by this, when I say one dimension, is um, we're able to resolve like the huge up and downs, but we're still not able to resolve like uh, these huge like side to side things. Um, so I think it's, it's a bit more advanced than that. I'm just trying to put it in as simple terms as I can. Um, so I think you can kind of see it here. So this would be like an example of stochastic green descent. And then what momentum would do is it just kind of reduces the fluctuations from up and down, but it still has these fluctuations in one dimension. So it's able to get rid of those random fluctuations in uh, let's say the Y dimension, but not in the X dimension. Um, so yeah, that's what, what, that's what momentum does. And I think I can just give like a really brief momentum, removes it in the other dimension and add dimension. Briefly, that was momentum. Um, let's see. 
Okay. Um, then we have RMS prop, and RMS stands for root mean square. And so root mean square is basically just a concept in math where we can, let's say we had a variable like x, um, we do x squared and we take the square root of basically a squared term. Uh, so it's not exactly like the square root of x squared because that's just x. It's like we have a term and we square it and we take the square root of part of it. So I know that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but root mean square is just the idea that we're able to take a square of a term, um, but then also kind of uh, move it down by using a square root. So like, I'm like probably not the best at explaining like what root mean square exactly is. Um, but again, you don't have to learn like the in-depth or like the exact math behind this. Um, it is, I would say pretty advanced, um, even though I learned it before. Um, so if you're like really interested in understanding how this works, even though I don't think it's very important, um, then feel free to search up how does RMS prop work and there's different like tutorials and courses I can point you to if you're interested in that. Um, but again, what uh, RMS prop, all it does is it removes fluctuations in another dimension. Um, so if I had, let's say this was like stochastic gradient descent, um, momentum would do this maybe. So I think it's, it's kind of hard to see the two dimensions, but um, basically stochastic, it would not only have like these fluctuations in the upper direction, it would also be side to side. So this point and this point are like on different, um, like they're not on the same, I don't know how I can really explain this, but like, it's kind of like that. It just fluctuated in all different directions, meaning it's fluctuations in the X direction, so in the horizontal direction, and also in the vertical direction. And so um, essentially momentum removes it in this direction and RMS prop helps us remove from these like awkwardly upward things that removes in that direction. And I may not be exactly right in which exact direction it removes, but all you really need to know for now is RMS prop is able to remove from one of these dimensions um, that it's like fluctuating in and momentum is able to remove um, the fluctuations in another dimension. So let's call this like X. Momentum's able to like reduce those fluctuations using exponentially weighted averages. Um, and RMS prop is able to reduce the fluctuations in let's say the Y direction using Uh, so like Clara is actually like there's a, this Coursera course by Andrew Ng it's called like deep learning selection um, and in the I believe second course it's called like hyperparameter tuning he has a video that explains this and this graph is actually from his video um, and so like it's a great way for explaining kind of how uh, like explaining the math behind this so like if you're really interested in math and you like it and you're just like fascinated by how this works and how it's just magically able to remove fluctuations in one dimension then uh, definitely feel free to check that video out. Um, and if you like questions, you can definitely just chat me anytime uh, while I'm going through this. So that was momentum and RMS prop. Uh, now we're going to go over what the atom optimizer does. And so atom optimizer essentially just combines these two different um, optimizers. So it combines RMS and it combines momentum. And it just takes both of them and uses constant terms. So it uses RMS. So sorry, it uses root mean square and also uses exponentially weighted averages. So it's uh, in a way able to remove fluctuations from both dimensions so that it's like the most accurate and similar to batch green descent. Um, so Shritan, the course is called Deep Learning Specialization. Um, it's by Andrew Ng. Um, so there's two different versions of it. So the course is actually a great course. It's one of the ways I've learned a lot of deep learning. Um, and so that course is by Andrew Ng and there's two different options. Either you can uh, pay $49 for it and get a certificate. Like if you finish it in a month um, and a month, uh, you would have to spend like two to three hours every day. It's pretty long. Um, but if you finish it in a month, uh, pay $49 certificate. Um, but if you don't want to pay anything, you can audit the course. And what that means is you don't get access to any of the quizzes or the assignments and you only get access to all the different videos. Uh, he explains all the math and stuff. Andrew Ng, if you don't know who he is, he's like a super famous guy. He's actually founder, a co-founder of Coursera, founder of deeplearning.ai, founder of landing.ai, founder of a lot of companies, uh, like a really famous guy. Um, so you can uh, 
take that course for free if you only want access to the videos. Um, but I would say it's pretty long, which is why we kind of have uh, this workshop so we can explain um, only the important details from that course. Because he does cover a lot of unnecessary, I would not say unnecessary, but like um, more advanced math based concepts. Um, so I would suggest just like taking the simple aspects um, for that. And uh, Shritan, you don't, I mean, you need like a basic understanding of statistics and just like understanding what a derivative is. Like I was able to take it in ninth grade. Um, and I just had like a basic understanding about those concepts. Um, so like you don't need a lot of knowledge before you take that course. Um, so I think it's fine if we just like dive right into it. But just be aware it is a lot of time commitment, especially if you're gonna pay the money and do like all the different assignments. Um, but I would say in the long term, it's pretty helpful. So this is the Atom Optimizer. So back on top, uh, these are just different optimizers, different variations of Atom itself. Um, and like a different variation of stochastic gradient descent. And so we're not gonna cover like some of these random variations. Um, we're just gonna cover RMS prop Adam and momentum is not listed here, um, but you can see just from this graph, Adam is just doing the best. This is a uh, iterations versus cost. So training costs versus iterations. Um, and you can see that Adam is just doing the best by far compared to these different approaches. Uh, so that's just like in general, you should usually use Adam, um, I would suggest using that optimizer. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over actually tuning these hyperparameters. And first of all, just explaining what hyperparameters are for those who do not know. So hyperparameters are basically just um, different variables, I guess you could say, that a user or a programmer is changing as they're coding the model. So uh, let me just get annotation tool. So let's say I had a network like this, and let's just pretend it's like fully connected. I just, I can't like draw the connections that clearly. Um, and let's say you just had two hidden layers, one input layer and one output layer. So the first thing you could do is change the number of layers. So I can add like insert inside of here, like three more hidden layers. That's something I can control. Um, I can also want inside of here, how many neurons and neurons. Uh, so this is four, I can change it to like 10. Um, so that's another hyperparameter. And that's for each of these different layers. Um, I can also change the alpha rate. So you guys are probably not learning gradient descent in great detail, um, but the way gradient descent works is it takes, um, it, it uses the process of back propagation. So if I had a network like this, right? Um, and then like a final output neuron, what it does is it just read, so, uh, you guys probably learned about forward propagation, I believe, like how you have a weight here and a value in here, and you just multiply the two to get the value of what should be in here. And you just continue doing that until you get the final value of the output. Um, back propagation essentially goes backwards and gets the derivatives of each of these different um, uh, lines on the weights. And it uses those, those derivatives to update gradient descent. So gradient descent, it uses the derivatives we get from the net network. So if you don't understand what a derivative is, um, it's basically just like if I had a curve, this is the derivative of this point. It's just a tangent line to a curve. Um, that's just like a graphical way of explaining what it means. Um, but that's the idea behind a derivative. You don't need to understand it in detail, but just pretend that we're able to magically get all the derivatives from this huge network. And once we get that derivative, um, we also have this thing called a learning rate. And a learning rate is something that we can control. So it's called a hyperparameter. Uh, we can control it um, any value we want. And it also has an impact in overfitting and underfitting, um, but it's usually not a huge deal uh, on what like learning rate you choose. But it is like, like if your model is performing poorly, this is a great way um, you can make it better by tuning this learning rate. And so gradient descent just combines the derivatives and combines the alpha rate and uses those two to update the weight. And so basically this you can see is a hyperparameter and something that we are constantly changing. Um, so um, yeah, so Shritan, I guess, yeah, it's another way of explaining instantaneous speed, um, but we're like, that's like, I guess in the physics way of explaining it, but we're not gonna go in depth in that. Uh, for now, for everyone who's confused, uh, let's say you just had a curve like this, so y equals x squared or whatever, like a parabola. Um, at this point, the derivative would just be the tangent line. The tangent line is just uh, 
different derivatives yet because like I just finished ninth grade, but this is just my basic understanding of what they do. Um, and I'm not going to go in depth how to compute them and stuff. Uh, so you do not need to know that. Do not think like you like certainly have to learn what a derivative is before you start machine learning. Um, you just need to know that you can tune this alpha learning rate. And the sign for alpha is this. That's like the Greek letter. And we can tune this to basically tune our model. So those were those three uh, different hyperparameters. Um, and then we also have two other hyperparameters. So we have the mini batch size and the learning rate decay. Uh, so I'm actually not going to cover this. This is a more advanced concept. Um, and so like, again, a great resource would be to check out that Coursera course, but the purpose of uh, these eight sessions, um, so that Coursera course actually, uh, just to make sure that it's clear, that Coursera course only focuses on neural networks. So if you're like really interested in how deep learning works, um, check out that course, but it doesn't cover any of the other models we're doing. So like random forest regression and stuff, it doesn't cover any of that. Um, so that I guess that would be like the one downside of it. It does not cover other models, which is why we have this workshop to give a brief introduction to each of these different concepts. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, another thing. So if you want to learn more about learning rate decay, uh, definitely check that out. But the idea behind learning rate decay is if we had initial value of, of the learning rate, so let's say it was like 0 0.2, uh, what learning rate decay would do is it just um, as the model's training so like we had this curve before so we had cost here and epoch here sorry i can't write that clearly but you get the point the learning rate so we can kind of change how this curve looks by tuning this learning rate and that's called learning rate decay um, help your model that drastically, which is why I'm not covering it. Um, but like, if you want to make minor changes, like increase your model by one or two um, percent, like in terms of accuracy, then you can definitely just check that out, search for the video, and understand how that works. Um, then you also have mini met size. I explained this uh, earlier. Like, if we had a training set like that, I can choose how many samples do I want in each of these different mini batches. And typically, you're going to have all the mini batches are the same size. I've like not really seen anyone who like makes them different sizes. Um, but yeah, that's the idea behind mini batch uh, size. So these are like five main hyperparameters. There's definitely more um, that I'm not going to cover, but I would say these are like the five main ones. Um, I might be missing one or two, but again, these are the main ones. So that is hyperparameters. Now let's get into kind of how to choose and determine which one is the best. So like. So let's say I'm going to tune um, something called alpha, which is that learning rate, and another thing called epsilon. And I'm not going to explain what epsilon is, but just pretend it's a hyperparameter used in neural networks. Um, or it could change this to like number of layers if that makes you feel more comfortable. So n is just going to stand for number of layers. Um, and so we have these two different hyperparameters, and what we want to do is find the best combination. So these are two different approaches. This one is called grid, and this is called random choosing. So a grid would just take like uniform points in here, like uniform points that are like all equally distant apart, and it would try to look at each of these combinations and determine the best. Um, but this is actually uh, like statistically, it's not been proved to be the best option um, because it doesn't take into account like a point here, because that could be like the best combination. We don't know that, uh, which is why we would just want to do a random approach. We just want to randomly choose any of these points and once we find uh, like a rel like a decent point, let's say we found it here. Um, let's say we're like using three hyperparameters and we're trying to find the best combination between all three. This is just a graphically um, presented way to explain how this works. Let's say I choose this point over here. Um, what I would do is let's say I thought this was like remotely what I wanted. Like this is like a correct approach. Then I can zoom into here and find, like, once I find a general area, I just zoom into the area and then check different points in there. And then maybe I can use a grid um, inside of this random area. But initially, we want to make sure that we're using a random approach so that we get all possible uh, different approaches rather than just making a grid. And so we actually do not need to manually do this, like, look for a random point and do that. Uh, TensorFlow has a tool that will automatically let us to um, check between different ranges and stuff. Uh, which I'm going to explain in probably like 10 minutes when we get to that. So that is 
uh, the concept behind random choosing is basically just a way for us to uh, choose the correct hyperparameter we want. Okay, um, so then of course to find is just the idea I was talking about, like how we zoom into a reasonable set of values. So let's say like I chose this value initially and I thought it was interesting, then I can just zoom into this general region and check out all the different points in there and see this combination from all. in depth, automatically going to be able to do these a uh, few things for us. Um, but again, this is essentially how it's going to work for how like TensorFlow is able to find the best option. Um, and then we have two different approaches. So um, like two different approaches for testing the best combination. So we have this Panda approach and this Caviar approach. And this is what Andrew Ng uses in that deep learning course I was talking about. And these are just made up terms. It's not like actually um, like legit terms. And it's, do not confuse this with the library called pandas that you've been using to like read CSV files. Um, that is not what this is. Um, but panda, the reason it's called panda is just because it's like slow and steady and it's not like, um, it's, it's only modifying one sort of curve. And this one is just like all over the place. So that's why it's called a caviar. Um, at least this is what Andrew Ng calls it. And so like some of you are probably wondering like when do I use one or the other? And let me, before I do that, let me explain what it, what each of these does. So essentially um, what pandas does is let's say like you were like looking at your curve on day zero um, and it was like doing fine, day one it was doing fine, but then finally just like goes up here. And they were like, oh, there's a problem here. So either you could just like stop the training using that early stopping thing I was explaining or we can like test these different hyperparameters. So we can like, let's say, change up the learning rate and change up like number of layers. And then it goes back down and just like goes like that again. Then we change the hyperparameters with these different combinations and it goes down again. So we can kind of change it as it's training. So that's one approach. The other approach is just do like 10 different curves with all the combinations. And this is if we have a ton of, um, computational resources and just like a lot of power in our computers, then we can use this approach. Um, but if you just have like one computer, this is probably not the it's, it's not run a cloud, so it's not based on what we're using. Um, so this is like really not the approach we're going to be using. It's mainly this and TensorFlow automatically does it for us. Um, but like if you were to make a model from scratch with no TensorFlow, uh, like purely Python, um, that's actually like a great exercise, um, like just not using any libraries and trying to like do all the math from scratch. So if like you're interested in trying to do that by yourself, you can um, like definitely check out that course I was talking about, like the deep learning specialization, um, or you can just like search up like the math behind it. But again, the purpose of this course is not going to go um, like in depth in math, it's more about how to create real life projects and use them to your benefit. Um, so I'm going to explain it at some extent of detail, but I'm not going to go super in depth. So those are the two different approaches. Um, and that's basically like the end of our slides for today. Um, okay, so were you okay, so Kavya said that like she can't really hear me properly. Um, sorry, that might be a problem with my internet. Um, I have like a lot of stuff running on my computer, so it's probably an issue from my end. Um, can you guys hear me clearly right now? Like, are, is there any breakup or anything? Okay. Sorry about the issues I had before. Um, but again, if you had questions or I missed on something, then definitely just ask me. Okay, so now that I've like went over these slides for like literally an hour, that's probably like boring for some of you. Um, and I understand that, but like a lot of these concepts are like important to learn. Um, so now we're going to put them into use using um, a TensorFlow tool. So I'm just going to stop my share. Um, I'm going to like share that Colab notebook. Give me a second. Okay. Um, 
Okay, since we're like running low on time, um, I'm actually like not going to give a student version of the notebook. Um, so like I'm not going to do like the filling out stuff like how you guys have done before. Uh, I'm just going to like get to the point, I guess, of how to tune your hyperparameters and just explain it as I go along. Um, like if, if you don't want to do that and you just want to like do it by yourself, then you can feel free to just like we can understand what I'm doing. Um, so feel free to do that if you want to challenge yourself. But since we're running low on time and since like Champions League final is like happening right now, um, I'm going to like quickly finish this and it'll probably end like 15 minutes early. So I'm first going to just share this. Um, how do I do this? Change view. Okay. Um, so I just sent in the chat. Um, so that's the notebook. So I'll give you guys like uh, like a minute or two to just open that up um, and then I'll start explaining um, everything in this notebook at 110. So just let me know if you can fully see what's happening um, or like if you can fully access the notebook and then I'll start. Okay, um, do you guys mind just like sending me a message in the chat if you're able to access that so I can start explaining? Okay, sounds good. So um, this is again different from what I did uh, last class. Uh, sorry, not what I did, but like what the other instructors did last class. So I'm not gonna be doing like the student version and stuff. Um, I'm just going to be explaining, so like you don't have to be, you don't have to code um, because I'll be explaining this as I go. So we're going to be using this thing called hparams dashboard. And this is a notebook that TensorFlow has made um, in the TensorFlow documentation. Um, so this is essentially uh, just a way for us to tune hyperparameters. So the first thing we're going to be doing is loading this. Um, yeah, it's uh, Shritan, you just do pip install to TensorFlow. Pip. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first thing you would do is a low notebook extension. And I don't think you guys have done this before. And this just enables us to use this dashboard. Um, so just load the board and then we'll be able to um, access like the hyperparameters dashboard. Uh, this command is just to remove previous logs. So like if I've run this before, I don't wanna see that like stuff I did before. So I'm just gonna clear all of that. So I'm just gonna remove those previous logs. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is just import TensorFlow like how you had done before. I'm going to run this as I go. And there's like different ways you can run this. I'm actually just going to press the run button uh, just because it's like satisfying. So I'm going to import TensorFlow as TF. And then what I'm going to do is import um, the API from the hparams plugins from the TensorBoard. So you're going to see that like we had to install the TensorBoard. And then uh, the TensorBoard has some plugins. And the specific plugin we want is the hparams plugin. And so we want to import um, the API as HP. And, a, and API just stands for Application Programming Interface, and it's just a way for us to access data, basically, uh, like in like simplest terms. So you guys use the fashion MNIST. Actually, no, you guys use the MNIST handwritten. So you guys used how to uh, classify like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9. 
I believe like two sessions ago, I think it was. Um, now, Fashion MNIST is just like a data set that contains a bunch of fashion items like shoes, uh, shirts, sweaters and stuff. Um, so we're going to be able to find the best hyperparameter uh, combination that would be able to execute the highest accuracy on this data set. So first thing we do is load in the data set and then we split um, into train and test. We're not going to be using validation. We're just going to be using train and test. And then you can see here, we're basically just normalizing the data by dividing it by 255. So it's kind of like on the same um, factor. And then this is something new. This is when we basically add like the different intervals or discrete values we want. So in this case, we just want two different options, 16 and 32 for the units. So again, this is a hyperparameter. We're using HP, we're accessing the API's hparam function. And we're basically just saying for the number of units, I want it either to be 16 or 32 because I'm using a discrete value. Um, and then over here, I'm specifying the dropout. So dropout is another hybrid parameter. If you remember, I said remove. Um, and so setting it from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 using this interval. And it's just like any value between these two. And then the final hyperparameter uh, thing I'm using is the optimizer. So I'm either making it atom or SGD. And SGD stands for stochastic gradient descent. So this is just plain stochastic gradient descent. Um, and the metric I'm using is accuracy. And so all this does is it basically just kind of loads up the stuff and in the hyperparameters thing. So it basically, we've created all these different combinations and then we want to load it up in the configuration over here. So we list all the hyperparameters with all these things over here and we list the metric we want. And so like this syntax is not important and just something you need to memorize. Uh, you just need to kind of understand how do I like determine the different values I want to change. So I have different values like that. Um, and then this is just me creating the model. So I have a flattened layer, which just flattens all the input. Then I have a dense layer. Um, as I've already learned this, the ReLU activation function. Um, and then a dropout, which is we want to add a layer of dropout. And that's when we put in this H params. Uh, we want to access the HP. Final layer, and it's going to be and softmax. And again, softmax is just when you have 10 different classes. In this case, we have, I believe it's like 10 different classes, um, which is why we have a layer like this. And then we compile our model by using the, you're going to see that like we don't actually put an atom here. We just specify hprems, HP optimizer. Um, and this is just going to be able to access the uh, atom and SGD here. You can see that over here, uh, what it's going to do is basically just put in two different variations inside of here. And we're going to be using sparse categorical cross entropy as our loss. So we're not going to be using like mean squared error. Uh, this is usually used, uh, this loss is usually used when we're like having a multi-class a classification problem. So if we're trying to classify different things, that's when we usually use sparse categor uh, categorical cross entropy. And if it's two different classes, I think binary cross entropy is the uh, best. And I'm not going to go in detail in the math of this, but it essentially just uses logs to, and it's like a very accurate way for uh, like. Um, and you can put different metrics you want, but for now, I'm only going to Think, uh, care about the accuracy, like you can put AUC, PPV, MPV, true positive, false positive, whatever you want, um, like dice score and stuff, but I only want accuracy for now. Um, then I want to fit the model and I'm only going to put one epoch, so I'm only going to run over one thing. And this is just for demo purposes, you can see. Uh, I just want to show kind of how to uh, create this, like how to modify your hyperparameters, and then you can uh, use this like later um, if you want to create like a bigger model, I would say. Um, and then you just want to evaluate the model on the on the test and then you just want to extrapolate the accuracy and return it from this function uh, because that's like what this function is doing it accepts the parameter of h params which is able to access all these different variations that we specified up here okay so now once we do that we just want to run um, so this is just running the model and th there's a concept called callbacks so we're not going to go into that but it's essentially a way for early stopping, I would say, um, but we're not going to go in depth in that. You can search more on that on the internet, but the purpose of this is just to explain how to tune different hyperparameters. 
Um, and then we have, uh, this essentially enables us to access, uh, sorry, what does this do? Oh yeah, it basically, uh, loops open and all the different hyperparameter options. So we specified that um, in the hyperparameters uh, dictionary and that's what we want to do. And then we just run it and we just increase the session number by one every time we finish one combination. Um, you can see this all gets run. Uh, okay, and then we want to be able to see the logs in that dashboard. So I think if you click on H params, oh yeah, I didn't run everything. Okay, uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, so like if we click on H params, we can actually see all the different combinations. So we had uh, 32, 32, 16, this is for the number of units. This is uh, different dropout factors. Um, and so like when I said the real interval, it doesn't take each value, it just takes the two different discrete values. And usually you would have more hyperparameters and more variations, but for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm just trying to show um, like the different, uh, like the ways you can customize and add different hyperparameters. And then the optimizer would have SGD and Atom like that. Um, and then it would just report all the different accuracies using all these combinations. And the highest looks like 839. So that would be 32 units, 0 0.1 dropout and Atom. Uh, you can see like Adam seems to be superior because uh, it's usually always better. Um, so yeah, it looks like this combination is the best. And then once we determine that, then we can just like tweak our whole notebook to reflect those changes. Um, and then this would just be to view the tensor board. Like if you want to see kind of like a visualize and see how it's working. Um, but I would say this is not very important. Only a table view is really uh, what matters to see like kind of what would be the best accuracy. Like you can always view these different sections, but I'm only going to look at this. And this, uh, this H params plugin is really helpful for us to see and kind of like you can also uncheck check these different kind of things uh, to find the best combination. So that's the idea behind this notebook. Um, it looks like I have gone over most of this. If you have any questions, um, ask me on the chat. You just need to run all these cells and see the output. Um, but I think we're gonna end like 10 minutes early. There's really not much else um, to do, I guess. Um, so like, unless you have questions, I guess you guys can leave. Um, yeah, no problem, Shritan. Yeah, so I think I'm going to end the meeting now. So here I go. Okay, thank you, everyone.